And they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God whom you serve continually rescue you. It's interesting that Daniel's friends were thrown in the fire by the Babylonians, but the Persians, they worshipped fire, and so they didn't use it as a form of punishment, but as a form of worship. So they threw people to the lions instead, much more civilized. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace, spent the night without eating, without any entertainment being brought to him, and he could not sleep. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to rescue you from the lion's? Daniel answered, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done any wrong before you, O king. King was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den, and when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had, not, he had trusted in his God. And at the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and thrown into the lion's den, along with their wives and their children. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. We made an intentional decision that we would all be in the lion's den story today. There's so much in the book of Daniel, as you know, because you've been doing the reading in the story. And as you're reading along, we could have talked about how, as a young teenager, they made an uncompromising stand in a, in a foreign culture and stood together on the principles that they believed in. We could talk about all the dreams that Daniel interpreted and the insights that Daniel had into the future, the seeing of the coming kingdoms that would be laid out and even the end times of the world. We could have talked about his three buddies, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's just fun to say. <laughs> and their stand against the king in a similar situation and being thrown into the furnace but we made, we made a decision all over in the theater, everybody here, every person on our campus this weekend, we're all going to talk about Daniel. In fact, you may have noticed the backgrounds of the songs that we were singing, that was artwork from our kids here on our campus. And, and so you'll see some more later. Maybe some of you will recognize um, something that your child drew. But we wanted to take the time to talk about it. Now, to be sure, what we'll talk about in here today is going to be a little different than maybe what some of the kids will talk about. But I think Daniel lays out for us a pattern for growth in the Christian life that we many times misunderstand. That God is calling us for a consistency, a no compromising kind of lifestyle that is consistent in our work and in our homes. And then when those things happen, then he uses us to put us on display, usually in a hard situation. And so I want to pray for us, and then we're going to jump in and look at Daniel at home and at work, and then how he gets put on display. Let's pray. God, thanks a lot for the chance to be able to gather together, and now we we acknowledge your presence here. You are here in a, in a special and unique way because of your promises, not because of who we are or what we're doing, but you have promised that wherever two or more are gathered, you'll be there in our midst. In a, and so we've, we qualify. We've got more than two. And that's the only qualification we bring. Everything else is we are dependent on your grace. And we tell you in humility, God, we want to be changed by you. We want to have insight into how you want us to live and how you want us to interact with one another. We don't want to be smarter sinners. We want to be changed from the inside by your grace. 
So use this time. Exalt Christ for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so let's take a look. Daniel at work. Um, we see him in the first five verses of chapter 6. So if you'd like to turn your smartphone to Daniel chapter 6 or whatever type of Bible you brought, um, you can also use your handout to kind of as a, as a help to walk through this. And we see in Daniel chapter 6, verse 1, it pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom. Satraps literally means guardian of the empire. With three administrators over them, one of them who's, who was Daniel. Now, what's just happened historically, globally, is that the Persian Empire has defeated the Babylonians and is expanding at a great rate. In fact, this kingdom will be the largest kingdom that the world has yet seen. It will move into India, all the way into present-day Turkey, even all the way down into North Africa. It will be gigantic, and the expansion helps happens very quickly. So the king is kind of in a, in a way that he's got to appoint some people and send them all out. Daniel, who, by the way, is in his 80s by this time, is appointed as one of the, the three administrators because he has exceptional qualities. Now, at this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds um, for charges against Daniel in his conduct of governmental affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we'll never find any basis for a charge against these, these, this guy, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. Now, just think about this for a minute, because I think sometimes we think about Daniel and we think, wow, he's an, he's an exception to the rule. We can't really be that. But let's just think about what he was in work. First, he was competent at what he did. I mean, by the time you're 80, if you've done something for that long, you ought to be pretty good at it. About the time we're getting really good at stuff, we start thinking about retiring. That's another message. But Daniel's been doing this for a long time. He's very good at it. He's competent at what he does. And this new king, Darius, who's just defeated this, this empire, recognizes and hears of this guy's skills. But the other things that he does are quite ordinary, really. It says that he's faithful or literally trustworthy, reliable. If he says he'll be there at 7, he's there at 7, if he, if best he can. If he says he'll get something finished, he finishes it. He's trustworthy. He's not negligent. He does what's expected, being responsible there. He's, he's completely trustworthy, but the word rather really is, is about not being corrupt. He's not associated with lying and stealing. Now, just look at this list. He's competent, faithful to do what he says, responsible and not negligent, does what's expected, and trustworthy in terms of he doesn't lie, steal, those kinds of things. It seems to me that most job descriptions you will ever see would require some things like this. This is not like this giant exceptional bar that no one's capable of. This is actually quite doable. If I asked you, if I just had one-on-one, -on -one, let's do it. Let me ask you, Mike, are, are you competent at what you do? I mean... You're not fired, so they still think you're doing it. Are, are you show up when you're supposed to. You're not stealing anything, are you? I mean, um, when you, are you meeting the requirements of the I mean, you know what I'm saying? Sorry, Mike. But I mean, well, come on. This is not like some huge requirement. What he's doing at work is the things that you would ask. If you were going to hire someone, you would ask these things of them. He does that. Now, here's the, here's the sad truth about the work environment. You stand out from the crowd if you consistently do these things. If you consistently do the minimum requirements of respectable work, as Daniel did. In fact, why is there a conspiracy to try to get rid of Daniel? Probably because they want to have some kind of a scheme to pad their own pockets, and this guy's not going to allow it. He has one other element that should be true of every follower of Jesus Christ. He's known in the workplace for his faith. Now, how do I know that? I don't really know how he's known. I just know they know. They say, we can, we're not going to find anything wrong with this dude unless we use his, his faith in his God. We've got to work out some way to do this. He does, I don't know that he's got, you know, tracks that he hands out at the water cooler. 
I don't know if he hosts a Bible study early before work, one day a week. I don't know if he has an opportunity to speak into some people and has ministered to people in their pain. I don't know what he's done, but they know. And they choose to use it as a point of weakness for him. We skip down to verse 10. We see how Daniel is at home. Verse 10 says, Now when Daniel learned that a decree had been published, that basically this decree said you have to only pray for the next month. You can only pray to the king. You can't pray to any other gods. You must pray to the king. Well, he ain't having none of that. And they knew that. That's, what, that's why they set it up. He went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem, and three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to God, just as he had done before. Now let's take a look at how he did it. What did he do at home? Well, he went home and prayed. He didn't go out on the street corner with a bullhorn. He didn't make a bunch of signs protesting the fact that he's got to pray to the king. He just simply went home. He went home as usual. What he had been, that's, this is his habit. Actually, this whole habit of going home and praying doesn't start in chapter 6. It starts in chapter 1 when he's a teenager. And now he's in his 80s. He's been doing this a while. This is a regular part of his practice. If you were to ask your neighbors who don't come to church with you, what is expected of someone who follows after Jesus Christ, they would say what, two things. I believe this is what I get most common. You ought to do two things if you follow Jesus. One, you ought to care about people. Because it seems to be the teachings of Jesus said something about that. And two, you ought to pray. What Daniel's showing us is basically minimum requirements. Doesn't go underground. He goes upstairs with the windows open, just as he normally has. He turns to the east, which has nothing to do with our traditions, really, but it, it was for them. Solomon had begun teaching this, that you would turn to the, towards Jerusalem, where the temple had been set up. It's actually an act of faith. For them to turn towards Jerusalem and pray that direction because there is no temple there right now. It's been torn down. So it's a statement of faith saying we will one day rise again as a nation. It'll happen. It'll happen. We can trust in God for this. And so as a statement of faith, they would turn towards the east, which I think is somewhere that way. So I'm actually preaching towards the east in, in concordance with this tradition. <laughs> Not... This whole idea of praying three times a day, this sounds kind of intimidating to you, and you might say, wow, I'm not sure that I really do that, but just think about this for a second. He probably got up in the morning and acknowledged the challenges of the day and asked God for help. Probably sometime during the day, a particular time for him, but in your case, in my case, it might be just sometime during the day we might say, wow, God, I could use some help here. I'm about to go into a meeting. I know they don't, it's going to be difficult. I'm about to go into something where I, I might say something wrong. God, guard my lips. Just a, just a prayer there. And then at the end of the day, thanking him for how the day went, asking for protection while you sleep. Come on, guys. This is, this is at least when Philippians 4 says, be anxious about a nothing, but in everything pray. I mean, we, are, we can at least do this. Are you getting what I'm saying here? Daniel at work and Daniel at home is a very doable model. It's something that we could all not just aspire to, but say honestly, some of us, at least, hopefully, could say, I'm there. I'm there. Now, what I want to show you is, is that, that we think that if we're obedient at home and, and consistent there and we're obedient at work and, and share our faith and every once in a while hand out a Bible and on Easter we invite our friends to church, that then God's going to take that obedience and in every instance, every single instance, he's going to elevate us to a great position of prominence. I mean, that's what the guys on TV say. If you pray hard and you have enough faith, it's all health and wealth. Your kids are going to turn out great. They'll have manners. They'll do well in school. <laughs> your, job will, your boss will love you. Your marriage will be great. You'll always enjoy tremendous intimacy with your partner. The problem is, if you have that kind of an expectation, you're, 
pretty disappointed a lot. <laughs> and you think Christianity is not working for you. See, I don't think people primarily grow like this. I think we grow kind of like this. And in those times when it seems to flatten, God is very faithful as we're faithful to what he's asking of us to put us on display. Now just think of this for a moment. Daniel is faithful. He is doing everything right. And he gets thrown to the lions. That, my friend, is more consistent with how life works. Hate to be a bummer here. Now, there's blessings. There's all kinds of good things. Daniel is, has a great house with several floors. He's elevated in his position and because of his competence, and he's going to be elevated after this. But when he's put on display, think about this for a second from God's perspective. If God wants to show people who don't know him yet, and he wants them to know him, his grace and his goodness and his love. How much grace is really exhibited in your wealth? I mean, we don't, we don't tend to see somebody who's rich and go, wow, wow, God loves them. Look at that German-made car. I mean, don't be offended if you have a German-made car. It's okay. But I mean, look at that. Look at that watch. Look at that ring. We, we tend... We tend to think something about the guy, not about God. But when we see someone enter into a struggle and they consistently and, and very honestly deal with their struggle and acknowledge God's help in the middle of it, we say, wow, God, that must be real. That's real stuff. So when we're at work and when we're at when we're at home and we're modeling that kind of character and God wants to use you and you find yourself in the middle of a lion's den, what I, want, what I want you to change your perspective on is this. Don't find yourself in the lion's den and go, oh crap, what did I do wrong? Now, now, let me say this, disclaimer. You might have done something wrong when you find yourself in the lion's den. <laughs> I mean, God is not a fool. It says in the scriptures, God's not a fool. He will not be mocked. You will reap what you sow. If you write a check and you don't have enough money to cover the check, it bounces, you, get, you have to pay penalties. You do that enough times, you find out like my mom did when I was 10, 12, they arrest you. So you might find yourself in the lion's den because of something dumb you've done. We, we've all done that, but that's not the issue. The issue is, is what do you do when you find yourself in the lion's den for doing things right? What if you were to change your perspective and say, God's on display here. God's deemed it that I am faithful enough that he thinks grace working in my life in this situation will bring him honor. Would that change how you face a lion's den? It certainly does for me. So how do we, how do we start to move this way? How do we begin to kind of go in this, in this direction? Let me read you a quote from Oz Guinness. He says, Our primary calling as followers of Christ is by him, to him, for him. First and foremost, we are called to someone, God, not to something like motherhood or, or politics or teaching or, or sales or Apple. And we're called to somewhere or to, some, or to somewhere like San Jose or Africa or something like that. So we're called to a person. Our secondary calling, considering who God is, is sovereign. Watch this. Is everyone, everywhere, in everything, should think, speak, live, and act entirely for him. That there's a movement um, in our lives that begins to say that we will seek God first. In your handout, I, I, I said it's substance over style. That we will seek God character godly character is the measures that will embrace Matthew 6 seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness that there is a submission understand this as followers of Jesus Christ there's a submission what did it cost you everything everything became at least second place or lower because God became first 
Now, a lot of times when we see this seeking of character, I'm not talking about some effort that you have where you just kind of build yourself up. 1 Corinthians 4 says, what do you have that you weren't given? It's not what I'm saying here. I'm saying more like as what we see in, in 2 Corinthians 3, beginning at verse 4. It says, such confidence as this is ours through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. God has promised that he will walk alongside you and he will not throw you into the lion's den until you're ready. And so he will build, he will grow, he will nurture, he will mature. Those little things that you do, the spiritual disciplines that you do. Daniel praying each day three times on a normal basis for 70, almost 70 years. And then he's ready. He's ready. So seek, seek substance over style. Stop believing the commercials. Seek God's character and his kingdom. Secondly, I think we can build our skills. Or I said on the handout, resist, your, resist shortcuts. Resist the... Here's how shortcuts work out. You, at least for me. I'm heading to a place I've been before. I'm pretty certain there's more a, dire, a more direct route. I take a direct route that I think I can feel my way through. Right, men? You know that... That inbred GPS system that men have. Somewhere along the line, I end up on a road that is parallel to the road I'm trying to get to, thinking that it's going to be perpendicular. And I drive six miles out of my way for a three mile destination. That's a shortcut especially in the areas of character. Resist them. There aren't any. You don't just suddenly wake up someday and accidentally become like Jesus. You do things habitually. Let me read you this quote. Man, it, it just gripped me. Somebody shared it with me this past week. It's by a guy named Robert Heinlein, I think is how you say his name. In the absence of clearly defined goals... We become strangely loyal to performing daily trivia until ultimately we become enslaved by it. Man, that is, that's, that is so descriptive of what life in the Silicon Valley can do. If you don't have a plan, there will be things that will come along and they will just consume every moment of your day. And soon you look up and days are stacked on weeks and weeks are stacked on months and months are stacked on years and suddenly you realize things that were really important to you that you wanted and longed to do, now you're two years removed and you've not done a single thing for it. Man, I, I, I don't know how many of you are all like, I get this. I get this. Ecclesiastes 10.10, if the axe is dull and its edge unsharpened, more strength is needed. If you're trying to cut, a tree, cut down a tree with a dull axe, you've got to swing hard. But skill will bring success. Stop and sharpen the axe. Become a lifelong learner. Build your skills. Resist shortcuts. Number three, just... Stay with it. Stay with it. Let me show you this. This is another quote that was shared with me this, this past week from St. Francis of Assisi. Start by doing the necessary, then do what's possible, and suddenly you're doing the impossible. Let me, let me share. Almost 12 years ago, we came to this address excited about what we were going to do. And th there are some of you in the room, I recognize you, that you remember worshiping over in the old worship center in 2001. There was no air conditioning. There was no heat. The outside of the building, it was like we tried to make it ugly. We painted it battleship gray. <laughs> we had a dirt parking lot. 
If you would have said then, let's do this, I would have quit. This would have seemed undoable. Six services, Saturday and Sunday, build new buildings. <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out how to preach where you'll still listen to me when the hum in the PA system wouldn't bug you. <laughs> the system hummed so loud that it, you know, if we had to sing every key, every key had to be in pitch with the hum. <laughs> the 60 cycle thing that was going. I mean, it, you, that's not how you live. You don't live about, you, you think about what can you do now. Here's a quote. Edward Hale said, I'm only one, but I'm still one. I cannot do everything, but I can do something. And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do something that I can do. Sometimes we just look at what needs to happen and we just get so discouraged about all that has to happen that we don't do anything at all. Do something. Just stay at it. Do something. You say, well, I'll never learn Spanish. Learn to ask where the bathroom is. And just go from there. But just start, to, really, you're, you could be, men and women, you, you and I could be just around the corner from something awesome. And we find ourselves kind of stuck in the lion's den, all afraid, it's dark. We can hear the lions breathing. They were licked, I think they're chopping, oh, what are they doing? Just going to be still. We're still right here in the dark, afraid. And we might be just a few hours away from the lid coming off of the den and you being elevated to the top position in the kingdom, which is what Daniel got. One more. Expect trials. Let me read you some verses we don't like. Okay? Let me just read them to you because remember we talked about last week all scriptures inspired by God and we got to take it all. Well, we got to take these too. So let me read you a few. James 1. Verse 2, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Not when, not if, not maybe, whenever. Watch this. This is a verse you don't want to read here, have read. 1 Peter 4, 12. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. Second Timothy 3, watch this. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Jesus Christ will be persecuted. And then finally, Jesus himself in John 16. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. Take heart. Jesus says, I have overcome the world. When you find yourself in the midst of some kind of pain and you can't figure out that you've done anything to get you there, then perhaps God has taken you and put you on display for somebody watching. And he says, look at them. There's a trophy of my grace. There's what it looks like to live this thing out authentically. Not perfectly. No one expects you to live perfectly. That's why Jesus came. But put you on display. And instead of moaning and groaning and gritching and griping about where you are and, oh, no, poor me, you might say, okay, God, I don't like it. And by the way, it's okay to pray. You know, these people bugging me, shut their mouths. <laughs> shut the mouths of the lions, God. But put me on display for your glory. It's not fun. It's not. But it's why we're here.
couple of verses for you to take with you that maybe if, if you're really challenged, especially, I, I believe this. I believe there's a lot of people in the room that need to change how they work. You come in this room and you talk about how important Jesus is to you and you sing songs of submission and lordship and belief and then you go and work like God has nothing to do with your life. It should not be so. Now, don't, don't feel judged. I'm just saying, I don't know who you are. I don't know who you are, but you do. You're not giving God a chance to work in your work because you're working it the old way. So if you're struggling at work, here's a verse for you. Colossians 3, 23 and 24. And it's at the bottom of your handout. You can just cut it out or recopy it on a three by five card. It says this, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. Translation, Jesus is your boss. He's watching. He wants you to work in such a way that it pleases him. Embrace this truth. Submit to it. Now, there's some of you, and I know, I know because I see you in the room. I, would, I know how you conduct your business. I would gladly do business with you. In fact, I am doing business with somebody in this room. If you're doing well in your work, then this is your verse. 1 Thessalonians 1.3. The writer of Thessalonians wrote this. We continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Your work is a work of faith. Your labor is already a labor of love. Your endurance and staying with it is because you have a hope that Christ will make things right. Stay with it. Stay with it. Embrace this. Become a person of faith, hope, and love. Did you notice that? It's all there. And continue to, to, to invite Jesus in to the daily things. The way you work, the way you conduct your business, the way you answer the phone even. Now, what's this look like? Let me share a story with you. There's a guy, and his name was Doug Nichols. Doug Nichols, many years ago, went to India to serve on a short-term mission trip, just about a month long. <coughs> While he was there, right off the bat, he gets really sick, and they have to put him in an infirmary. In this infirmary, um, he, would, he would wake up in the middle of the night coughing, and he was there for several weeks. One night, when he woke himself up coughing, he looked across, and there was a patient across from him in a bed, up, trying to get out of bed, but he was too weak, too feeble. He didn't know what to do, so he just laid back down and went to sleep. The next morning, the nurses, he noticed that there was a terrible smell. And the nurses were over taking this man and, and pushing him from side to side really rough. And the doctors were yelling at him. And he realized that this old man had soiled his bed. And what he had been doing the night before was he was trying to get up to go to the bathroom and was too weak to go. Now all this time that this guy, Doug, has been there, he's, he doesn't speak a word of the language. Imagine being in an infirmary in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a hospital in India. He don't speak any language, but he brought some tracks that were in their language, and he was passing them out, and every time he tried to pass them out, no one wanted anything to do with him. They just politely refused, some not quite so politely. And they didn't want anything to do with him. The next night, he coughed and woke himself up, and he looked across, and the old man was trying to get himself up again out of bed. He didn't really want to get involved, and he wasn't sure it was even the right thing to do. He didn't know what the man had in terms of an illness. But he got up out of bed, and he went over he picked up this feeble, 100 nothing pound man and carried them into the room that served as their bathroom. It was really just a room with a smelly room with a hole in the middle of the floor. And taking this man over, he 
went around behind him and put his arms underneath the man's armpits and suspended him over the hole in the floor so that this man could take care of himself. He helped him clean up, carried him back into the bed, laid him down, and turned to get away to go back, and lay back in his own bed. But before he could, the man reached out and grabbed his, grabbed his shirt and pulled him down to him, kissed him on the cheek. The next morning when he woke up, he noticed that all of the nurses were coming and asking for the tracks that he had brought. The doctors even wanted to know what he had to share and was able to begin to give those things away. He still couldn't speak, didn't speak a word of the language. Patients began to ask, can you begin to, can you share? He couldn't figure it out. He didn't know really what was going on. He didn't put two and two together really. Until finally a couple of weeks later, one of the missionaries that spoke the language came and, and said, Doug, you're almost well. We're going to prepare to get you out of here and send you home. And he said, I just want you to know, by the way, almost everybody here on staff has come to faith in Christ. He said, that can't be. I can't, I don't, who did, how did that happen? I can't, I haven't said a word to anybody. And he said, it's because you're the man that gets up in the middle of the night and carries that old man over there to the toilet. That faith, they wanted to know. Now, before you get all fired up and say, yeah, I'll carry somebody to the toilet. <laughs> Remember this, he had been obedient to leave home. And the first thing he did when he got to India was got deathly ill. I'm sure his parents and his friends back home said, told you not to go. What, what an idiot, told you. And yet God was setting him up to put him on display so that God's love and grace could be shown in a selfless, serving way. This is why Christ came. He modeled this very thing for us. Setting aside the glory of heaven. Setting aside the wonders of being continually in the Father's presence. Taking on flesh and blood for us. So that he could... In essence, carry us to the toilet. Communion is about remembering that act. That Jesus set aside all that was rightly his. Came to the planet for us. Took on and bore the penalty of mine and your sin. Nailed it completely to the cross. Defeated it and rose from the dead three days later. To signify and, and, and show that his work was accepted by the Father. We, above all people, have resources that Daniel didn't even have. We, above all people, should be willing to be put on display because that's what Christ did for us. Putting all of humanity's sin on display at Calvary's cross. As we celebrate communion is. Mike and Michelle, which is so good to have them back, but it's just as they come and lead us through this time, I pray that you just take the first bit about this time and just, just give God a chance maybe to speak. I know there's a lot of people here and you say, wow, I got to hurry up and get something. Over in the theater, you've got more time. So just relax, relax a little bit and say, God, is there anything about my home life that's, that's duplistic, that's not consistent? Is there anything about the way I'm working that you'd like to speak into? Anything about my life, God, I just give you permission. And then as you come and take the elements, after de dealing with what God has brought to your mind, you take the elements celebrating the reality of Christ's resurrection as payment for sins. If you're here and you're visiting and you're not a follower of Christ, thrilled to have you. We think this is a great place to hear about Jesus. But it wouldn't be consistent for you to come and take elements celebrating something you don't really believe yet. So you can just relax and stay there and watch. It's no pressure. There'll be several believers who won't take communion today too. So don't assume anything about anybody not getting up. Leave that alone. And let's, God use, let's let God use this time for his purposes in each of our lives. In each of our lives. Let me pray for us. Jesus, thank you for living such a consistent and great life, a sinless life, 
and then being willing to suffer in such a way that you have modeled for us how grace goes on display. Would you create in us the maturity that embraces those kinds of times? The discernment that understands, is this a sin issue or is this just a, a, a display issue? Would you use this time to do business with us in our hearts? If there's something that you want to root out or expose, I pray, God, you'd do it in a very strong and undeniable way. So that, Christ, you are lifted up among us. And that the truth of what we sing is not only true generally for people, but it's true for us. Use this time as only you can in Jesus' name. Amen.